was a, a terrific presentation, Chris. I kind of love the fact that we're talking about innovation, but we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're still talking about things like narratives and storytelling and stuff like that. Things we've been doing since we've been cavemen. Um, that's, that's really interesting. Um, my presentation is on dual diagnosis. My name's Brandon Jones, and I'm the manager of education and training here at Longtop. While um, I'm talking about dual diagnosis, I suppose what I'm talking about really is uh, workplace or work practice changes and working with work practice changes. And we're being asked to address a lot of work practice changes a lot lately, whether it be working um, whole of person, whole of government, um, outcome orientated services, working with cold, working with uh, consumers, all of them important things, but all of them requiring change. And so I suppose in many ways, this is our um, account of how we've worked with change in regards to dual diagnosis. It probably will help inform how we work with change in the future as well. So, um, we know that change is constant. We've talked a bit about change in the past. Thanks, Chris. Um, he'll clean up later. Uh, <laughs> But we also know that it can be exciting, but it can also be very difficult and hard. And I think it can be difficult and hard, especially if you're a frontline worker that's pretty um, under-resourced, pretty stretched, pretty unappreciated, slightly more appreciated after yesterday's announcement from the federal <laughs> government, but still pretty unappreciated. And so what we really need to effectively do is um, look at what kind of foundations we need to, to develop. And I was lucky enough to come into an organisation where uh, people like Donna Ripton Turner, Lawrence Alvis, uh, Julie Bowen and a whole host of others had already been working on, the, on foundations. They had a great relationship with Summit. Um, they were working on a number of dual diagnosis pilots, both in Gwyneth Williams' house and working with complex clients. Um, Managers had been sent to do postgraduate courses in dual diagnosis, or part of the postgraduate course included dual diagnosis. Reciprocal rotations were being done. So a lot of that cultural change work was already being undertaken. And, um, you know, in many ways, getting management buy-in, whether it be from, and board buy-in, is incredibly important. And a lot of that had already been happening. <coughs> So what do we need to effectively do from here? Then? What we needed to do was we needed to place a structure, I suppose, within that culture. And that structure we sort of looked at and we sort of thought that the best place approach would be a workforce development approach. And there's a lot to talk about workforce development. Um, I'm not sure it happens as much as I would like it to. But workforce development, as far as I'm concerned, is, is it's a movement away from just training. And it recognises that it needs to be within a co training needs to be within a context of organisational development, change management, transference of evidence-based knowledge and skills. It's sort of like to me. It's like we, you, when we work with clients, we don't just focus on their just their alcohol use. We look at the function of the drug use. We look at the context of their lives. We work with them in a holistic manner. We'll, Working in a workforce development approach is a similar thing. We don't just skill up the workers. We've actually got to approach the whole organisation in regards to changes. We've got to change <coughs> the context where the people work. So, when we looked at workforce development, we covered a number of different areas. So for us, it was looking at the strategic plan, making sure that dual diagnosis was incorporated within the strategic plan. Um, if we're looking at policies and procedures, clinical guidelines, partnerships, um, clinical review, a whole host of different things, induction supervision, it went right through, ensuring that the whole organisation approach in regards to change. I won't bore you with that diagram too much longer. What I really want to talk to you about is probably about four elements of that workforce development. One of them is uh, was the dual diagnosis leadership group that we effectively uh, started up here and we're into it. 
we identified a number of important leaders within Moreland Hall that we sort of thought could help affect change within the organisation. We targeted them, we got them to come together in regards to uh, a number of different forums on sort of more advanced dual diagnosis leadership training if you like, and then we met afterwards and sort of effectively talked about supervision, support for workers in regards to dual diagnosis, and, and also they were usually representatives of people, um, of people in committees and meetings right throughout Moreland Hall. So we were needing to ensure that they were representing dual diagnosis as effectively as possible within the organisation. Um, the other thing we did was we had a clinical review. And with clinical review, we met once um, a day. And with clinical review, we actually sort of looked at uh, the, the, the uh, clients that people were seeing, their um, care plans and, and treatment plans and how, um, what we could effectively do with that and really look at things like what were we doing with dual diagnosis and now I'm pl pleased to say we're sort of you know, doing things like looking at um, how we're working with them in regards to family practice and a whole host of different things. It's a nice framework for us to be effectively looking at um, different workplace or practice changes generally. The other thing we did was uh, we looked at uh, training our workers in three competencies. Uh, we were lucky enough to uh, uh, get some materials from uh, the Victorian Dual Diagnosis Initiative Education and Training Unit and we adapted those to our own workforce. Uh, we rolled out that training and one of the units, the very first unit, it's sort of your foundation knowledge if you like, it's sort of uh, um, uh, the Mental Health Act and service, uh, service service system, that sort of stuff. Um, some of that information our workers knew, some of that information some of the workers just didn't know. So there was a great disparity in regards to the level of knowledge within the classroom. So what we actually decided to do was put that knowledge online so it had a more of a self-paced approach. Those that knew that knowledge could go straight to the assessments, those that didn't could actually sort of step their way through the online environment. Um, and the other thing that was really important for us, I suppose, was to ensure that there was a um, whole of organisational um, ownership. Um, I, lo I love the idea of dual diagnosis portfolio. I think people should have some, should be someone that's sort of driving things and having a bit of responsibility. But I think that we all should have a sense of ownership in regards to dual diagnosis because if it just relies in, or lies in one person, when that person goes, so does a lot of that knowledge and, and, and momentum and movement. So um, for us it was really important to ensure that everyone had buy and everyone felt that they were a part of the dual diagnosis approach. Um, this is the point where people's eyes glaze over usually when I'm talking about <laughs> continuous improvement. But for me, I, I actually think it's a game changer because it's, I came into a sector alcohol and other drug sector where quite often we would play the game of we've got it right, your organisation's got it wrong. And, um, and, it, and it's not very healthy. It's not healthy for us, it's not healthy as a sector, and it's not, certainly not healthy for our clients. Well, I love the idea of continuous improvement where it recognises that we're all working towards getting it right, but none of us will get it absolutely right. And what we've got to do is continually check and make sure that we're getting it at as good as we possibly can. And I hope that eventually we'll actually use each other, and I mean different organisations, to strive towards getting that better and better. And I suppose the other thing in regards to um, uh, continuous improvement was that for us there was a lot of database that we, uh, data that we would need to sort of work from. And so we used, um, and your eyes can blows over now, um, things like the DDCAT, uh, which is sort of like a dual diagnosis audit tool. We did a two-week snapshot in regards to dual diagnosis and mental health issues. We uh, did a pre and post test uh, skills training, and basically we based it on uh, Gary Croton's dual diagnosis criteria. And we applied it, got our workers at the beginning of the training, we actually measured their skills and knowledge, and at the end of the training, we measured their skills and knowledge. Evaluations, anecdotal reports, but really for us, that continuous improvement process really required an effective 
integrated organisation. So it meant that education and training and clinical services were working in a very um, integrated manner. And, um, and I think I've, I've felt really lucky to be in an organisation that uh, allowed that to be. Um, so, the lessons learned through that process. Um, look, I think there were a number of different lessons learned. Uh, I remember saying, going somewhere along the lines, that if you're not learn, if you're not making some mistakes along the way, then you're absolutely not being innovative, and I think that's true. I think the irony of that quote, though, is that it was actually said by Woody Allen, who I think's made some probably some innovative mistakes, I'm sure, but he's also made some pretty stupid mistakes as well. So I think for me, it, it was a reminder that not all mistakes are innovative and we've got to keep our eye on making sure that we're not making the stupid mistakes. And part of that is making sure that we're not repeating the mistakes of the past. And certainly I'm glad to say that some of the mistakes that we sort of ha uh, had with dual diagnosis were new mistakes. There were things like or well, certainly for this organisation. There are things like the dual diagnosis leadership group. For us, it, um, it was a nice idea, but, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of organisations are similar, a lot of our workers or managers, team leaders, they are brilliant clinicians, and, um, and so, rightfully so, they've been uh, made managers and so forth. But, not always have we trained them up in that sort of leadership management skills space. And so we were sort of asking them to do a number of sort of leadership management uh, tasks without necessarily that skills base. So we went back to senior management team and who were also sort of identifying that as a, as a, as a need for the organisation generally. And um, they basically put up some money, talked to the board and put up some money in regards to uh, management training. So there was those sort of things. Um, the other thing that sort of uh, we probably could do better is things like consumer movement. We, you know, we are at the beginning stages, I think, in regards to involving consumers and, and clients. Um, uh, the other thing I think that we um, could do better in regards to the fact that we seem to have nailed uh, screening and treatment at this point in time. Uh, sorry, screening and assessment, but in regards to interventions, I think that we can move, uh, ad move forward a lot more. And I'm really looking forward to the next couple of years in regards to what the, um, really sort of nailing down those interventions. So those are the lessons that we've learned. Uh, I would like to thank both the uh, organisation board and all, but also the Department of Health and Ageing for allowing us a certain amount of resources, and, and you don't necessarily need money all the time for innovation, but it does help. Um, so I would like to thank them for that. So that's the end of the presentation. Thank you.